This is Yesterzine, the literal magazine show. Every episode, we take a magazine from the Golden Age, pass judgement over the best and worst rated titles, and see if the issue has anything to teach us about gaming, in an age before giant day one patches made media physical in name only. This episode, we welcome you back from your summer holidays with Sega Power, issue 47 from October 1993, an era in which Sega ruled the UK. The Mega Drive was right at its peak, the Mega CD was attempting to show the future, while the Master System and Game Gear were still getting top quality releases. In terms of the best and worst though, the future is 16-bit, with the saviour of the Mega CD doing battle with the license from a Robin Williams movie. And in the cover feature we discover what happens when the corporate marketing bods get their hands on the idea of a mascot platformer. But first, the Mega CD apparently needs saving, and there's only one game for the job. The Mega CD certainly did not have a perfect birth. Despite taking well over a year to make its way from Japan to Europe, the initial software lineup had been… thin. The launch window, largely consisting of some barebones Mega Drive ports in Chuck Rock and Sega's own 5-in-1 collection, Final Fight CD and Solfias, all of which we'd seen before in cart form. The first genuine CD release in the PAL territories caused problems of its own, as it was the horror FMV game Night Trap. A title that, while clearly impossible on a cartridge-based system, certainly did not excel in traditional gameplay, as much as I'm fond of it in hindsight. We joined the story six months after that release, and the release list had rather continued in that vein, with CD ports of Flashback, Batman Returns and Echo the Dolphin that did little to justify their existence beyond adding Redbook Audio, and joined by the likes of Make My Video style titles from Digital Pictures featuring CNC Music Factory, In Excess, and Criss Cross, the X button of bands. Not exactly the content that's going to part anyone from north of £200, and you could argue the Mega CD never got anything that qualifies as that. But the CD exclusives were at least on their way. A month after this, Sega would unleash some people's favourite hedgehog-based game ever in the shape of the ambitious Sonic CD. Sega Power's anointing of Thunderhawk as the saviour of the Mega CD is, on the face of it, interesting. Because what Thunderhawk isn't is a CD exclusive. In fact, while it's not on the Mega Drive, it was, at this point, already a two-year-old Amiga game, albeit a well-received one. And as such, I don't think we can judge it in context without playing that version first. Things are getting desperate. Yes, Mr. President. Is the equipment ready? Final preparations are in progress, sir. It's a two-disc game, but disc one is entirely the animated intro, with the best acting ever. Jack Marshall, the chief tactician. And the pilot? One of our finest, sir. To be fair, you've only got 880k, and acting takes up quite a lot of space. Now, we're not reviewing this version, but I should warn you now, it does not support a second drive, nor will it boot straight off disc 2. The intro is also apparently unskippable. When you spend a lot of time loading a game because you are, for instance, capturing footage, this is infuriating. Anyway, we get on to disc 2 and finally remember to save a snapshot in WinUAE, and you get the standard intro music, which very much sounds like a chilled out version of the Top Gun theme to me. Wrong war vehicle, but very nice nonetheless. It's a good thing you're relaxed, mind, because the menu system is both obtuse and convoluted. Nonetheless, we managed to pick an easy campaign mission to get a sense of the thing and go to the war room to watch the briefing. Now is this goodwill for our new host or goodwill for the people we're leaving? What did Bush say in 1989? I assume it was some kind of war on drugs thing we're referencing and not, for instance, yes, I would like to supersize. Actually, I kid a little. The manual includes the quote, which was indeed drugs related, and in fact expands nicely on all the briefings. It's very nice of them to ring their bases with white powder. They must have some spare for some reason. Helicopters? That's hinder a problem. 
We're here to improve relations, and we're going to do that by calling this a backwater desert. Hi, we'd like to be friends with your meaningless country of pointless real sand and expensive illegal metaphorical sand. This is actually a really involved briefing. If I wasn't here just to be generally sarcastic, then I'd recognise just how good the scene setting is here for a game where the actual game part is well under one megabyte. I still don't understand the menu, but having done the briefing in the war room, we click on the briefing room to be rebriefed in part before choosing our weapons and heading out. I appreciate the autoload system here for people who didn't grow up playing Microprose's gunship. You do have to give them credit for the presentation. The external view of your helicopter taking off is lovely. The game itself is almost entirely mouse controlled, which is surprisingly non-awkward and is a great way of getting analogue controls onto a mostly digital system. It's a little weird that you have to hold down the right mouse button to change your height, when tapping it also changes your weapon, but it works well enough. You do see where they saved some of that space though. The graphics in the actual game are sparse but functional for instance, and the sound is basically non-existent. There's no engine noise, no music of any type, and everything is communicated by your various warning beeps and explosions that are, hopefully, as far away from you as possible. There's a small number of keys, mostly the function keys, controlling some of your view options but also the chaff and flares that'll help screen you from radar and missiles, as well as radar and IR jammers. You can also see the damage computer and get impressive views from your weapon and your target, something later first-person shooter games stole for glory kills. Bare bones it may be, but technically Thunderhawk judges it about right. It's also not especially easy, even in this easy mission, but I'm more than willing to make that my fault, and at least part of it is down to the variety of jobs to do, there's tanks to destroy, buildings to blow up, and even those enemy helicopters to get into dogfights with. And helicopters were not designed for dogfights. You are backed up by decent weaponry though, including a default loadout of guns and missiles that'll seem strangely familiar to those who played Desert Strike, which is basically the arcade cousin to this title, albeit one that actually came along a bit later. So the Amiga version is absolutely worth further investigation. But does the Mega CD game do enough to change a game you could now pick up for a tenner on Amiga into a system seller for a near £300 CD add-on? And more to the point, how does a game almost entirely mouse-controlled transfer to a digital joypad with considerably fewer buttons than the Amiga version had keyboard controls? Well, the intro is certainly a lot more rock, isn't it? That in itself probably illustrates the difference between making what was at least on the surface a semi-serious sim on the Amiga, versus making a console game on CD where you need to justify your storage use. Our first clue on how this is going to handle comes from the control page. We're clearly before the 6 button pad here because I do have one plugged in, but we still just have the controls for throttle, presumably height, and the select and fire weapons buttons. I have a question. Isn't the rotor supposed to rotate, not the helicopter? The clue's in the name. Also, isn't the rotor supposed to exist in the physical realm? The briefing is now fully voiced, but contains surprisingly less video than I was expecting. It's also really short. If you leave it, it'll repeat forever like some kind of passive-aggressive primary school teacher. Still, it's appreciated, as is the fact the menu system does not appear to actively hate me. It's also important to pay attention to the briefing, especially the location of things as the mission itself doesn't appear to have much in the way of a waypoint system worthy of the name. We drop into one of those missions, and it's absolutely more arcade than the Amiga one, to the extent that I slightly regret using the Desert Strike comparison earlier. Because other than your perspective, this is actually really similar in its approach. To the extent you wonder if the release of the first Desert Strike between the two versions of Thunderhawk might have influenced Core Design's thinking on how to approach the conversion. Here's what I meant by listening to the briefing though. The radar is a confusing mess of icons, and while it indicates primary targets when you get to them, they're not specifically denoted on your radar in any form, and it's a very busy battlefield, especially once the more mobile enemies get involved and start dunking on you. 
This is the point you miss chaff flares and any of your more active forms of defence. On the first attempt this was fatal, as eventually I found myself reduced to a point where my only real choice was to run the hell away, with the primary mission partly uncompleted. I very much appreciate that since I did survive, the game does continue. I believe if you keep making these mistakes you'll eventually be fired in a more or less literal sense, but it's a sense of continuity that I think adds quite a lot to the game. So what we have here are two very different games under the same name. From the Mega CD side, I think Sega Pan may have overegged this one. If you've got a Mega CD and you're not going to buy Thunderhawk, then you might as well just throw it in the trash right now. This is the game your Mega CD was made for. They're right. Sort of. This is not a game that really takes advantage of being on a CD. Even after all that speech and the lengthy video intros have been crammed in, it's still only an 150 megabyte game plus CD audio. What it does take advantage of, especially in the daylight levels, is the extra processing hardware in the Mega CD allowing better sprite scaling. Attractive, but is that really the draw to spend nearly 300 notes on a mid-generation refresh? As was often their way, Sega Power got overexcited and distracted, and that quick explanation is basically what they take over half the review to talk about, finally getting to the actual game midway through page 3 of a 4 page review. They accept it's a short term feast, the gameplay not changing much across its 40 or so missions, but when I first read his complaints about death, I realised it doesn't actually have a huge amount of the other kind either. The 3D world is incredibly stingy with Gradient and I couldn't help but think that a SNES in Mode 7 might be able to do the whole thing just as quick, without needing to tape what was effectively a whole new console to the side. Or the bottom if you're using a Mega Drive 1. These days the game's probably worth you trying, but its biggest problem is the sequel, which appeared on Saturn and PlayStation. It expands the speech, most notably to help with acquiring primary targets, and presents a more convincing sense of being there, with at least an attempt at the odd instance of hills. These days it's also easier to get hold of than a legit copy of this, and I'd just go ahead and do that. The Amiga version is a surprise, and presents something way above most attempts at the same thing on the Amiga. Usually, it's the arcade game that's aged better when you get an arcade and a sim, but the simple sim mechanics of the Amiga one are something I'd much rather go and take a punt at than this, especially with the advanced controls. The Mega CD would have to wait another month for a compelling gameplay reason to own it. These days, a proper full price commercial release is almost always something that requires immense resources. We're talking at least 100 people for a couple of years on the low end for something that can be released at full price without being laughed at. Game budgets are into a not small number of millions, and so rarely does a marketing department from outside gaming see that as a good use of cash. That wasn't true in 1993. You could probably fund development of a game for the same price as a smallish TV ad campaign or putting toys in the bottom of a box of cereal. Don't try that last one today, mind. You'll be escorted out of your local Tesco in a heartbeat. And if you were really lucky, the sales might even result in you making some of it back. And so it was viable to make an entire full-price commercial game based on snack food. They did. And one of them is in this issue, earning a stonking 27% that somehow doesn't make it the worst game of the month. Chester Cheetah in Too Cool Too Fool. If you're British, I'm guessing the first question you're going to ask me is, who the bloody hell is that? Well, Chester was, and still is, the mascot of a cheesy corn snack called Cheetos, which is super popular in the US but virtually unknown here, thanks to being off sale in the UK between 2002 and 2015 or so. You will these days find them in Tesco, where you should leave them while you buy what sits instead. In fact, the purchase of what's its by Walkers, the UK distributor of Cheetos, is probably the reason we didn't have them for a decade. But this isn't snack chat. Did Sega Power have a go at Chester just because it was a licensed game, or is this really a mistake in cart form? Okay, so the more attentive of you will have realised by this point that this is the self-same issue of Sega Power we are judged very, very guilty in the 73% trials earlier this year for giving the all-time classic run-and-gun Gunstar Heroes that mark, while referring to it as a platform game. I got quite cross. 
So there was every chance that they would be wrong here. But first impressions are very much not. It's a slow, empty pseudo-platformer without actually that much platforming in this first level. Chester has two cool moves, jump and dash, although you can't dash until you find his trainers somewhere on the level. All of this is completely irrelevant though, because if you platform your way to the end of the level, which takes about a minute, then you'll find you can't exit. At this point, you do what you perhaps should have done first, and have recourse to the manual. To give you a flavour for this, I phoned Rose Tinted Spectrum, the one man cool enough to give this legendary piece of 90s culture the enthusiasm it truly deserves. Here, he reads the story verbatim from the manual. Yo, welcome to the Chester Cheetah registered trademark. Chester Cheetah registered trademark here. I'm a cool dude in a loose mood, a righteous kitty from the heart of Hip City. But right now, I'm being held against my will in Four Corners Zoo, like Squaresville. I just don't dig this lame zoo gig. What you want to do is help me make it through every stage in Four Corners Zoo. When all stages are mastered without meeting disaster, I can ditch this zoo and ride away to Hip City, USA. Once the adventure starts, keep your eyes peeled for motorcycle parts. Dig this, Chester Cheetah registered trademark, ordered this really boss chopped hog from a motorcycle catalogue, but me and Eugene hid pieces of the cat's rad cool machine all round these zoo grounds. Help Chester Cheetah registered trademark collect the missing parts today. There's one piece hidden in every stage of play. When you retrieve every last nut and screw, Chester Cheetah registered trademark can bolt the Four Corners Zoo. While finding parts to Chester Cheetah registered trademark's motorcycle, collect points by advancing, walking, jumping, geeking, and eating power-ups through numerous levels of play. We can then advantage to each of the stages of gameplay. Dear Christ, that is both incoherent and painfully 90s. And that's after I cleared it up a bit too. Look at the actual manual. Not only are there numerous typos, your graphical design friends are currently trying to get their head around how someone got paid for this layout. Also, collect points by advancing, walking, jumping, geeking and eating power-ups. What in the hell is advancing if it's not walking? And which of my two buttons is the one that does the geeking? Maybe the geeking is under the unused button. Let's try it. Ah, oh, that's it. But I didn't seem to get any points. Or laughs. That's by no means the only crime the manual perpetrates. It twice manages to misspell introduction. And the basic setup page is straight up stolen from another game, advising the owner to plug in the second pad for a two player game, something this game does not support. A fact it told you a page earlier. It also tells you to insert the Deadly Moves cartridge, which was a fighting game from the same publisher a year earlier. It was painfully average, but if the alternative is this game, then insert the Deadly Moves cartridge is actually sound advice. So back to this game, and it quickly becomes obvious that if there is anything in this level, it's going to be hidden in the sewer tunnels below it. So many sewer tunnels, all of which you have to crawl slowly through. The holes up and down also never quite line up with the end of corridors either, so you end up awkwardly shuffling back and forward for a bit. Sorry about the noise at this point. I'd realised hammering the dash button made Chester move marginally quicker, and I think we'd all agree we need this to be over as soon as possible. Deep within the 16th tunnel, I found this, a motorcycle bit and then made my way to the exit. There's apparently six levels in this game. I think now I know which tunnel is the correct one, I could probably have finished that one in under two minutes. I attempted level two, discovering the invulnerability pickup that makes Chester dance, but makes him practically impossible to move, somewhat limiting its usefulness. But then I got lost in a maze of ropes and awful to terrible swinging sections, and decided to move on with my life. 
pausing only to highlight this adorably shit climbing animation. Unfortunately, moving on means specifically moving on to the sequel, which appeared a scant seven months later. Well, this time someone is admitting to having written it, although as we saw with Rise of the Robots, that might not be a plus. Ooh, there's a story again. Hang on, I'll call Rose Tinted Spectrum. Hey Rosie, there's a story for the second game too. You up for reading that one? So this is going to sound like I'm hanging up on you? Oh, you must be busy. In any case, this is better presented than the first game. It even appears to have a branching open world narrative. This is almost promising. Let's get into the game. Oh well. First issue, look where it scrolls. I'm three quarters the way down the screen here. That's distinctly unhelpful and makes avoiding this bastard really hard. I have this on easy mode. This is a game for kids in easy mode. This whole thing feels harsh. As it opens up a little, I realise what we have here is basically a Poundland version of Cool Spot. It also doesn't become easier. That said, unlike the first one, this is a much more coherent game, and at least I've not scrolled through a million sewers. Like the first game, there's few levels, in this case it appears to be 10, and I got to the boss near instantly on Go 1, especially without motorcycle parts to find. That said, this is at least non-insulting, but I can't believe I'm about to borrow a phrase from elsewhere in this issue of Sega Power but use it correctly. If you have Cool Spot, you don't need this. If you don't have Cool Spot, buy Cool Spot. That's an easier task in the UK. Neither of these games made our shores, so there's no real danger of coming face to face with it in your local CEX or finding it lurking in an eBay bundle. So are there any better ones? Well, absolutely yes, and we don't even need to leave the world of cheesy health hazards now owned by PepsiCo to find one. Over on the Amiga and ST a year earlier, Ocean, masters of the licensed platformer, had released Pushover. Another snack that's fallen out of favour a bit. Quavers are a potato-based fried snack. If you've never encountered them, imagine prawn crackers but cheese flavoured, and then imagine them being cardboard flavoured. And if that's surprising as a concept, consider this. Ocean, masters of the licensed platformer, decided to take this fairly kid-focused licence and turn it into a pretty rock-hard puzzle game. Pushover's branding is somewhat less explicit than in any of these other games. On the Amigarama podcast, Lafarius pointed out that Quaver's branding was jammed in right at the end of an 18-month long development period, so that's why the game doesn't rely on it at all, and Colin Curley is only really in the intro. The game itself is a puzzler, where the object is simply to push over all the dominoes using one push, have the right domino fall over last, and within a tight time limit. Your mechanism for this is G.I. Ants <sighs> ability to move most of them around, although you do have to leave the level in a state which allows you to reach the exit, also within the time limit. Quickly, the game introduces dominoes with special abilities, such as this bouncy fall forever bastard from an early level. The level end screen is adorable, as the code to skip straight to the level next time is fished out for you by G.I.'s Ant Buddies, Compli, Rely, and Compet. I love the music for this game, by the way. It's very jolly and really feels more like it's from a Game Boy Super NES game than the Amiga. Pushover did actually have a conversion to the SNES, with the advertising stripped out for the international market. It's a decent little puzzler, and was popular on release, getting 99% from AUI in some sort of fever dream. But 88, 83 and 79% from the three more sane magazines. And if you've paid attention to anything Amiga related on this channel, you do not need me to tell you which one is which. Personally I think that's about fair. Although I could have done without the double difficulty of the time limits when you essentially have infinite lives. It's a shame there wasn't a Game Boy version really, because in structure this is perfect for handhelds. Flush with success, a sequel to Pushover was commissioned, and One Step Beyond appeared in 1993, almost exactly at the same time Kaneko was farting out the first Chester Cheetah game. Again, it's a puzzle game, 
But again, they defy expectations a little by not going for the lazy sequel and instead coming up with an evolution of the concept. With the branding in from the start, so is Colin, and in a neat piece of joined up thinking, he's actually playing pushover in the intro. Where completing it, just as he finishes his name brand cheese snack, causes some science, which pulls him into the computer. The broad concept of One Step Beyond is the same as pushovers. But in this case, you have to close all the platforms before you land on the second pack of quavers. Which, if you don't read the controls properly, is really confusing, since level 1 already seems impossible. The one special move you do discover from reading the manual is an ability to double length jump. Like pushover on level 2, the special platforms start to appear, and from this point it becomes simply mind-bending, although I think I prefer being in direct control of my fate with Colin, rather than everything coming down to a push where I might not have thought everything through. Again, the music is lovely, and again, I could do without the time limit. One Step Beyond is in many ways the perfect sequel, iterating on the original game while remaining familiar for fans of it. It actually scored marginally higher than the original in most mags, although AUI had come down off their high. Of all magazines, Amiga Power gave it the highest score at 87, from Mark Ramshaw, who was also the reviewer for Pushover, and Thunderhawk. It seems weird that, albeit without region crossover, we got four full-price commercial games inside two years, all designed purely to sell cheesy heart attacks in a bag. It's even weirder to think that two of them were actually quite good. If you've been paying attention, you'll realise it's probably the last time we'll need to say that sentence in this episode though, because I said 27% wasn't the lowest score of the issue. And unfortunately, I meant it. Everything here should have worked. Toys should have been the movie event of 1992. It was directed by Barry Levinson, who gave us Good Morning Vietnam and Rain Man. It reunited him with the star of Vietnam, Robin Williams, about whom no justification is needed. It's got Michael Gambon, Joan Cusack, Robin Wright, and LL Cool J in it. It's got Hans Zimmer music. There is nothing bad here. Except, unfortunately, the movie. The mind-bogglingly stupid plot is explained by the game's intro at almost absurd length. But basically, Man owns Toy Factory. Man is dying. Man decides to put military brother in charge because Toy Factory apprentice son does not take things seriously. Military brother gets factory making military equipment disguised as toys instead. So Toy Factory apprentice son sneaks in with military cousin to take the factory back. Oh, also his sister is a robot. And he's in a relationship with a random young woman his dad hired because that's a perfectly believable and not at all shoehorned in love story plot, apparently. Obviously, it bombed. With a box office less than half its surprisingly high budget, which, combined with the release of the very similarly named Toy Story a couple of years later, probably explains why you likely don't remember it. And if you do, you wish you didn't. If you've never seen it, just watch Death to Smoochie instead an equally unsuccessful Robin Williams film with an equally superb cast, but one that actually deserved more. The game also should have been good. The producer was David Crane, creator of half the games worth playing on the Atari 2600, such as Pitfall, as well as three of the more famous early Simpsons games. And if you know their history, you've twigged who we're dealing with here. This is by Absolute Entertainment, aka Imagineering Inc., about two years away from going out of business at the end of the development of Penn & Teller Smoke and & Mirrors, an unreleased game with a charity lifespan decades after its non-release. Between The Simpsons and Penn and & Teller, this should have been promising, but you already know where we are in the episode. A 24% review for toys that has the classic warning sign of spending half the review talking about the storyline, something I'm in serious danger of being guilty of, and there's a reason for that. I've played this. So we get to the end of the intro and we're up to date with the story, which for the game is only actually the very last part of the movie, the assault on the factory itself. As Ian Toys, your job for the first level is to use the toys you pick up in the factory to destroy the General's war toys, and more to the point, his security cameras. As if he doesn't know you're there when you destroy them on camera. 
find this out in a second intro, which is again about four times as long as it needs to be, but at least now we'll be able to play the game. Oh god, will it never end. Yes, a third scene, with the general tediously typing out commands to his troops, rather than, for instance, using his meat flaps. The game is eventually controlled from the isometric, but so zoomed in, any strategic planning is absolutely impossible. There's no map either, which is incredibly unhelpful in large samey levels with no landmarks of note at all, other than identikit conveyor belts, each of which provide a new toy for your arsenal, although there's no particular indication if you already have the one from this particular carousel. And actually, let me praise the game here. The selection of weapons is varied. You start with the peanut gun, but even in just the first level, which, spoiler alert, I will never get past, there's also bowling balls, radio controlled cars, and mechanical chickens to help you out. In another, better game, this could have been a lot of fun. The controls though are awkward. Aiming any of these weapons, even the ones that want to be aimed, is a luck rather than judgement affair, and some, like the cars, basically just swarm. And this is the killer, really. To get to the cameras, you have to destroy their guards, just running in as I tried to do doesn't work, but the guards appear to be all but indestructible, even when I spam weapons in their general area, and all the while they're able to laser shot you and your tiny health bar. I looked for other footage on YouTube, and there's only one other gameplay video of someone having the exact same experience as me. He never gets off stage one either. Given that as a game this must have been intended for kids, this is brutally difficult. How many games is there not a full length playthrough for on YouTube, especially ones based off high profile movie licenses? It's probably for the best though. Levels 2 and 3 are essentially the same as level 1 according to the review. And then, apparently, there's a horizontal shoot 'em up level as the finale. I say apparently, because although the review very briefly mentions it, with no detail whatsoever, there are no screenshots of it in the magazine, which highly suggests Sega Power never saw it. The same is even true on Moby Games. Has anyone finished this game? I certainly haven't. I certainly won't. Sega Power offer the interesting recommendation of Toe Jam and Earl as an alternative. I see where they're going with that. Toe Jam is also about exploration from an isometric viewpoint, but it's not a shooter. It is, however, a considerably less awful game, and one I'm quite fond of. So when you finish watching Death to Smoochie, play Toe Jam and Earl instead and pretend both are this. You'll be a much happier human for it. And that's nearly it, but I did just want to show you one thing that caught my eye. Last season on Yesterzine, we looked at an issue of Amstrad Action from 1986, which included an interview with the founders of Codemasters. In it, Mike Clark talked about other publishers selling games to kids for 9 95 when they could produce quality for £1.99. There's a lot of very fat cats out there, he said, and that's bad. He goes on in this vein for some time, as do the other members of Codemasters management. I mention this because here we are seven years later, and what's this in the review section? Why, it's a Dizzy game, for £40. How times change. And we reach the end, and as payment for his entirely appropriate 90s reading of the manual, the back page once again features an advert for Rose Tinted Spectrum. If you want a video suggestion, why not catch up with his retrospective series about children's video game show classic Bad Influence? your definitive guide to why we all watch Games Master instead. While you're like, subscribe, following him, do the same for us, because there's much more coming on this season of Yesterzine, including at least one of us featuring in an actual magazine. Doodles!